Welcome to This Lawyer's Life, a podcast of the New York City Bar Association. Today we meet Joam Elizme, founder and managing partner of Elizme Law. Joam and Greg talked about how Joam made the decision to open his own law firm. It starts with an idea, and that idea evolves to an urge, and that urge evolves to the need to take action. I knew that I wanted to create something that would reflect a culture that I wanted to build. Joam gave us the benefit of his experience in navigating the challenges he faced on that road. A lot of our solo practitioners are afraid to hire because of the potential overhead that comes with hiring help. I knew that if I wanted to to grow the firm, I had to get past that fear. Joam also talked about how giving back to the community is part of his vision, as well as his bottom line. You have to be able to put yourself out there and to be active in the community so that you can get out there and help both your community and your business at the same time. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the city bar. Here's your host, Gregory Benstock. Welcome to This Lawyer's Life, a professional development podcast where we talk with lawyers about seizing opportunities, learning lessons the hard way, and about what makes them tick. I'm Gregory Binstock, Director of Professional Development here at the New York City Bar Association, and today I have the pleasure to chat with Joam Elisme. Joam Elisme, you own your own law firm where you focus on representing small businesses in litigation matters. You served in the United States Air Force, you clerked in the New York State Unified Court System, and you worked with the nonprofit Everytown for Gun Safety, and now you're here with us. Welcome, Joam, and we are so glad to have you join us. Thank you for being here. Of course, Gregory. Thank you for having me. Uh, It is uh, an honor to be on this podcast, and I look forward to uh, having a very fruitful discussion with you this afternoon. Thank you. Joam, some people have a summer law experience, as you know, in law school, and they never leave the firm after that, or they're with the firm for many years before they make a career change. I take it that's not your experience. Can you tell us about your path into the legal profession before and after law school? Yes, absolutely. Like you mentioned, my path was not the traditional summer associate and then being an associate at a big law firm. My my path was a little bit different. So after I graduated law school, I clerked for a judge in Kings County Supreme Court in the commercial division. And I did that for three years. And as you mentioned, in that particular role, I was very involved with the judge's calendar. I conference cases for the judge. I assisted the judge with trials. I drafted decisions for the judge. So my experience there was quite comprehensive from the judicial perspective. So after doing that job for three years, I then transitioned and worked for one year as a legal fellow at Every Time for Gun Safety, as you mentioned, which is a nonprofit that focuses on a- advocating for gun safety measures across the country, both at the state and federal level. At, in, in that position, uh, I took it on because at the time, as you know, gun violence is pretty prevalent in the country. And when I took on that position, there had been a couple of shootings that happened very successively after each other. So I figured that I would joined that effort to try to change some of the laws across the country with respect to gun safety. I did that for a year with the intention that eventually I would go back and work at, in a law firm doing commercial litigation. But this time, instead of doing it from the bench's perspective, I would be doing it from the practitioner's perspective. And so after leaving every time for gun safety, I went and worked for a law firm in, in the city doing commercial litigation, taking on cases like contract disputes between businesses, business partnership divorces, shareholder actions, things of that nature. And I did that for just for a year. And my experience in the courts really helped me in terms of that particular job because I was very familiar with the key players in the court system. I knew some of the judges personally. I knew some of the court attorneys uh, personally as well. And so when I would make appearances in the court, those connections uh, really existed me. And after doing that job for a while, um, I decided I would start my own business. I've always had an urge to start my own practice. And I felt that at the time, 
the experiences that I had in the court system married with the experiences that I had in the private practice uh, arena really worked well for me to start my own business. And the timing was correct. And so I decided to launch my practice in March of 2020, just as the pandemic was starting. And we can discuss further how that played out, but that's how I launched my practice. And now uh, it's been going on for just over three years. Before we get to that, I want to go back to your experience as a law clerk. It strikes me that you're at an interesting intersection as someone who was part of the court personnel and also someone who believes in gun protection and gun safety. In the news, as you know, there are unprecedented threats against the judiciary, and it goes all the way down in a sort of mind-boggling way, not even just to judges, but all the way to court clerks and those personnel of courts. From your perspective at that intersection, can you enlighten us on how you read this and how you see those items in the news? Absolutely. It's a very important question because, you know, judges, they are public servants. Uh, In New York, some of them are elected and some of them are appointed, but all of them are really people who are trying to do good by the community and trying to serve their role in the legal process. And But sometimes they get threatened by people who are unhappy with the decision that they've rendered, are unhappy with how the uh, judicial system play, played out in terms of their matter. And sometimes those people are mentally you know, not well, uh, mentally un- un- unstable, and decide to take matters into their own hands. I remember a couple of years ago, there was a federal judge in New Jersey who uh, read their decision in the matter against an, an individual, and that individual went into her home and, and killed someone, and the judge almost lost her life as well. And so we, as judicial personnel, we are very cognizant of that. And so we, we try to take every precaution necessary, but at the same time, you know, judges, they have to follow the law, right? There are certain rules and precedents that uh, are on the books that judges have to follow, right? They can't just follow their own personal opinions because of safety reasons. And so while we are rendering our, the decisions, we are also mindful that uh, we have to take precautions to maintain our safety because, like you said, uh, it's, it could be quite dangerous uh, with individuals out there who are unstable and have access uh, to weapons that could do uh, a lot of damage. And so when I went to work uh, for Every Time for Gun Safety, that was certainly something I had in mind as well, to try to not take away people's Second Amendment rights, but to try to make it safe for others who are at, at risk of being impacted by individuals who have access, easy access to firearms, and that can do damage to uh, their family members, to other members in the community, and to public servants like judges and, and politicians, et cetera. I know when I practiced briefly, I always found going into 60 Center Street to be a strange experience. It's a labyrinthine building, and you sort of feel a little bit on the outside coming in. I'm sure you get over that if you practice for a long time. But I'm interested to know from your perspective on the inside, having been a law clerk there for years, and now being on the outside as a practicing attorney, you mentioned that you have a different perspective because you've been on both sides of it. So I'm wondering if you were to write a tell-all book called Secrets of a Law Clerk, which to me sounds like a bestseller, what would be high on that list? What would you tell attorneys that have never worked inside the court that you can share with us from your perspective of having worked inside. Yes, and I'll correct you just a little bit if, if, uh, if you allow Please. me. You said 60 Center Street. I did not work in 60 Center Street. I worked sure. in Brooklyn, 360 Adam Street. And, 360, and okay. us Brooklyn Knights are very protective of our Brooklyn cred. They represent. <laughs> oh, but no, I've been into 60 Center Street a number of times. And, and like you were saying, going into a, a building like that, whether it be 60 Center Street or 360 Adam Street or any buildings, and courts around the city can be very intimidating for a lot of people, especially if you're not, you know, attorney or a court personnel, because those buildings are quite large. They're imposing, right? They're structured that way because they want you to be humble when you walk in there so that, you know, you can prepare yourself for whatever verdict that the judge is going to render. And judges are a place on an elevated position because, you know, we want people to respect judges and their decisions. And 
what we try to do, at least in my with my courtroom, with my judge that I work for, we try to make the process as accessible as possible to the common individual. When uh, people would walk into our courtroom, if they were not represented by counsel, uh, we would tell them that they had the right to be represented by counsel. We would often adjourn their matter to give them uh, enough time, sufficient time to be represented by counsel because if someone is in there and they don't have an attorney and the other side has an attorney, that person is at, is at a significant disadvantage. And so we, we informed them that they had a right to be represented by, by, by attorneys. And also the, the judge that I worked for would make it a point when we had jury trials to treat the jury with respect, to give them breaks when they needed it. And after the trial was over, we always interviewed the jury to make sure that we got their feedback about the process to make sure that the process played out smoothly. And, and so being a public servant, it's a public service, right? We serve the public. And so we try to make sure that we serve the public in the best possible way so that folks could have a good impression of the court and to leave the court with the sense that justice and whatever that means for, that, for them was served. Okay, so you mentioned you started your own law firm. We obviously want to get into that in great detail. How does that happen? Putting aside the pandemic, which we can also talk about, how do you come to the decision that you want to hang your own shingle out? Yes, so it starts with uh, an idea. And, and that idea evolves to an urge. And that urge evolves to the need to take action. And, and you, you just get to a point where you have to take action. You have to do something or you're not going to be able to sleep at night. And so I got to that point where I wanted to start my own business. I had worked uh, in other areas and other organizations for quite a while. I had worked at a firm and as we mentioned, the courts. And by, by that point, I knew that I wanted to create something that would reflect a culture that I wanted to build, uh, the type of people that I want to work with the type of clients that I wanted to serve, and in the manner in which I wanted to provide that service. And so it made sense for me to start my own practice. And it was not easy. And as with everything, including the law and, and lawyers, the first thing that I did when I wanted to start my own practice was to conduct research. I reached out to a number of small law firm and solo practitioners around the city, a bunch of, of them that I knew, and I interviewed them. I asked some basic questions. You know, how do you start your own practice? How do you form uh, a business? What type of uh, uh, entity do you build? Is it a, uh, a sole proprietorship? Is it a limited liability company, a LLC? Is it a partnership? How do you get clients? You know, where do you go to get clients? Uh, what type of system do you use? What type of emails do you have? So just basic questions about how to set up the business. And then after I had sufficient information, I was prepared, you know, to launch. And then when I officially started my practice, I made a point to join the small law firm committee at the city bar. And that committee proved to be a wealth of knowledge and resource for me because it is made up, as I'm sure you guys know, of a number of small law firm owners around the city who've been practicing for quite a while. And when I joined the committee, a number of them took me under their wing, including the then chair and Wilson, and a number of other people as well. And I was able to kind of rely on them for information about how to set up the practice. And I served on that committee for a number of, of years after that. And, you know, once you have the idea to start a law firm, all you have to do is just go for it and everything else will fall into place. And how did you decide what area of law would be your specialty or did that sort of find you? So... My decision for what area of law to go into came quite easy for me because of my background in the commercial division. As I mentioned, I worked for three years in the commercial division, and that division is a specialized division in the New York court system that deals specifically with business dispute matters, including you no know, partnership divorces, breach of contract, disputes involving boards of corporations, things of that nature. And I also did similar cases when I practiced at the law firm. And so that area is something I was familiar with, what I knew. And so it was quite easy for me 
to go into that area. And I quite enjoy it because, you know, it comes easy for me and I'm able to serve my clients because of my background and my experience, both in the court system and in the private sector with regard to those type of cases. You talked about the culture that you were looking to instill in your law firm, both in terms of the clients and your colleagues, your prospective colleagues. As you started to think about hiring, how did you think about the size of your firm, who you'd be working with, and how did you begin to approach, you know, thinking about the personnel that you needed to launch? Yeah. So when I launched my practice, I launched it uh, and with the idea that I would build something that I could be proud of. Uh, when I worked at the, the law firm that I worked uh, at after I left the court system, I worked with a you know, bunch of great attorneys, but unfortunately, the law firm was not as diverse as I would have liked. And in fact, I was the only uh, minority attorney at that firm. Uh, but I, le- I learned a great deal from the attorneys there. The attorneys were great attorneys. I learned a lot about how to really manage a case from the beginning all the way through discovery and, and through trial. So I also learned key things about how to manage a practice or how to build client relationships and all of that. But the culture just because of the personnel that was there was not something that it could have been more ideal to, to put it mildly. And so when I started my own practice, it was a very important thing for me to build a firm with diversity in mind, you know, starting with me, of course. And as I hired people to make sure that the, the, the personnel that I'm hiring reflect the diversity of New York City, right? Reflects, you know, racial, gender, you know, uh, identity uh, and all of that of New York City because that's what the city looks like and that's what the clientele is going to look like. I'm not just trying to to cater to one specific clientele. Certainly, I'm trying to serve you know business owners, but uh, everybody, every race, every creed owns businesses in New York, and so I want to make sure that the firm is diverse. I also wanted to make sure that the type of clients that I was working with are people that uh, actually want to work with. Not every client is equal. Some clients are belligerent. Some clients are, you know, disrespectful in how they interact with the attorney. And so I wanted to make sure that I had the control to be able to take on a client that uh, would treat me professionally and vice versa. And then I would provide the best value as possible because as I've learned throughout my career, attorneys perform their, at their best when they're working for somebody that they can respect. Right. That's when we perform at our optimal level, when we are working for somebody that we can respect, when there's a mutual understanding both ways. And so I wanted to make sure that the type of clients take on reflected that. And also in hiring. Now, when you're hiring as a solo practitioner, it's not easy. And a lot of our, our solo practitioners are afraid to hire because of the potential overhead that comes with hiring help. But for me, I knew that if I wanted to, to grow the firm, I had to get past that fear and actually hire people. And I was able to do that partly because of the help of my business coach, who kind of helped me understand the economics of hiring, that if you hire somebody, you're not necessarily just spending money, because when you bring on the extra help, that person is going to not only free up some time for you, but they'll also be able to build more. Therefore, they'll be able to, to pay for themselves in pretty short order. So that's what I've been trying to do. And I've also been hiring uh, attorneys who are, are within my circle. One of the attorneys that work with me, I met at the city bar, actually, at one of the, of the city bars networking events. She's uh, an attorney that's been out for about five years. And we met, we had a discussion. I told about my firm and what we're trying to build. And now she's working with me in the firm. So culture, you know, providing value to the clients, making sure that the clients or clients that we work with are very important tenants to me. And those are things I'm keeping in mind as I continue to go to practice. Okay. So I definitely want to follow up on belligerent clients. But before we do that, let's talk about wonderful clients. What are the kind of things you look for in a client interview that make you think, this is definitely someone I want to work with, both on the case level and the personal level. Yes. So at the firm, we have a policy, and I'll make sure to keep it PG here. That policy is that no a-holes, 
got it. Who did not work with anyone that fit that description. And we make sure to, sh to share that policy with prospective clients. So that's number one. You have to treat us with respect and we'll treat you with respect as well. Number two, uh, we make sure that clients who take us on, while they want to be involved in the matter, there's also an understanding that they'll give us space to actually provide the kind of service that they're paying us for. That's very important. And number three, we also want clients who pay for their, you know, the service that we provide in a timely manner because clients who are late in, in, in paying their fees is something that can, you know, potentially affect the relationship in a negative way. I mentioned earlier that uh, attorneys work optimally when there is respect uh, between them, them and the clients. Part of that is paying the attorney for the services that they're providing in a timely manner. If that's not happening, then the attorney is not going to be able to perform in an optimal way. And also, we work with clients uh, that fit within the rubric of the type of cases that we're looking to take on. And so if the matter is not a, a contract dispute involving businesses or a partnership dispute or a shareholder action, we don't take on the matter because that's the area that we focus on. We try to niche down so that we provide the most optimal service and value to the client in those matters. If a matter is not within that particular rubric, we don't take it on because we feel that it will, instead of helping the client, we may end up hurting them. So we make sure, you know, that type of cases are cases that uh, we actually work on so that we make sure we, we provide that value. You mentioned a few times that there, some of your career has intersected with the New York City Bar Association. You are not a plant, but you are a wonderful <laughs> invite from the City Bar. Yes. But there is something else I wanted to ask you about. I understand you're a graduate of the New York City Bar's New Lawyer Institute. Right. And I wanted to understand if you could share with us, what is that institute about and how that impacted your career? Because I understand that, that played an important role for you. Yes, I was very a member of the inaugural class of the New Law Institute, which was a program that was started by the City Bar a couple of years ago to kind of usher new uh, lawyers into the profession by giving them mentoring, by organi organizing programs that can be helpful for them in early on in their career to kind of help guide them as they went along. And I was a member of that program. That program was extremely helpful. Uh, I met some of the key members of the City Bar's staff, including Martha Harris, who is a mutual friend and a colleague of ours. And I also developed relationships with other members of that program that I still have today, uh, including a number of my colleagues that I work with now. And that program essentially was my entree into committee service at the city bar. Uh, without that program, I would not have been as involved with the city bar and likely would not have been able to serve on the small law firm committee when I started my practice. And the city bar has been extremely helpful to my career. I'm not a plant. I'm not just, <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to uh, push the agenda here, but it's just the truth. Uh, I've been involved with the city bar in some capacity uh, throughout my entire career. And uh, I've uh, hosted CLEs at the City Bar. I'm uh, a bit very involved with the uh, Small Law Firm Symposium. This year, I'll be part of a panel where we'll be discussing how small law firm owners should go about hiring and you know how hiring is a tool that they can use to help their growth accelerate. And I can't say any enough positive things about the City Bar. It's a great organization, and I'm happy to be involved with very kind of you and uh, and appreciate it. Of course, we're, you know, we are asking for your time here. So we know that you're a City Bar superstar. Let me ask you for a preview about this panel about hiring. If I were, you know, launching my firm and I said, Joanne, I'm interviewing someone this afternoon, you know, give me two tips or a, you know, a horrible experience that I can learn from. I don't know how to approach this client interview. What do I need to know in, in a minute or two? My advice to you, if you're just starting a law firm, I will tell you, Gregory, hire sooner rather than later. Don't wait. Hire because you are just one person. And a law firm is a business with different, you know, departments, different personnel. And if you're just one person, you are serving as 
all these personnel. If you are just one person, you are your own assistant, you are your own paralegal, you are your own associate, so on and so forth. And so you have to start delegating those roles as early as possible so that you can free up your time. The first person that I would tell you to hire would be an assistant, an executive assistant, someone that can manage your emails for you, you know, schedule your calls, your, you know, your calendaring, someone that can take the burden of the ad- admin work off your shoulders so that you can focus in other areas of the firm. Because as a solo practitioner, your time is most profitably used when you are doing client work, when you are giving value to your clients, when you are build, billing for your client. You're, if you're doing admin work, you're not using your time as productive as possible. I would also tell you to not be afraid and to be willing to make mistakes because your first hire is probably not going to end up working out well. It may be somebody that is not a good fit for the culture you're trying to build. It may be somebody that you simply don't get along with. But the key is to, you know, get past that mistake and to try again. I've had to let go a couple of people in the past, but eventually I find I found some key employees that have been really good for the firm. The person with the longest tenure on the firm right now is my executive assistant. And what made her a good fit for me is the fact that we get along well. We get along well, we have the same values, and we were both able to work well together. She's learned how to anticipate certain things about the practice and about myself, right? She manages my schedule. She responds to my emails. She drafts, you know, basic documents for me. And so the relationship that we have is based on mutual respect. And it's based on the fact that we go along quite well. And so that's why it's lasted, you know, as long as it has. So you have to keep trying hire as soon as possible, start delegating tasks, because that's going to free up your time to focus on the client work, to focus on marketing yourself, to focus on doing CLEs, speaking engagement and, and networking, things that will bring in the business and help you grow. Do you take uh, contingency cases or do you work mostly on an hourly basis? Yes. So right now I work on an hourly basis because most of my cases are business litigation cases. And those cases, they tend to last a while, especially if the litigation is going to be quite active. And unlike a personal injury matter, where there's usually an insurance company involved, those cases, it's not like that. Those cases don't involve insurance. And so for the most part, all my cases are hourly basis. We require a retainer up front from the client, and then we build against that retainer as we work on the matter. Understood. I want to talk a little bit about mentorship. I understand you do outreach to high school students and to law students through your law school, which is uh, New York Law School. How are those mentoring relationships a part of your professional identity? So mentor is very important to me, and I think it comes natural just based on my background, having served in the military. In the military, as you mentioned earlier, I served in the Air Force for four years. I enlisted out of high school. And as a member of the Air Force, you are taught to, to be a leader, you are taught to be a mentor, to make sure you reach back as you move along and kind of help others who are behind you. And when I was in law school, uh, I was also quite involved in the law school community. I was the president of uh, a couple of uh, student organizations. And after I graduated, I became a member of the uh, law school's Al- alumni board of association, and so I'm quite active with my law school. And it was also important for me to, to give back to the community, to reach back, especially among um, minority communities, because as you know, there are not a lot of minority lawyers in New York, you know, it, what nationwide, but in New York specifically, the number of minority attorneys, black male attorneys, it is not a, not a lot, and so. I think it's important for people like myself and others who are attorneys, who have their own businesses, it's important for them to go back and to talk with high school students, folks who are at the cups of going into the next phase of their life to let them know that this is not something that's impossible, that is quite doable, and that, that they're needed, that their presence in the legal profession is very much needed, 
there are clients who are looking for people like myself to represent them and it, they're having a hard time finding those people. And so the more uh, we have, the better. And so I make it a point to do that through a legal outreach, which is a program uh, at NYU that happens every year. I go there and I give a talk to high school students about uh, what it's like being an attorney and just show them that it's something that, that's possible for them. I also talk to other attorneys who are looking to start their own practices. I've chatted with a number of, of my colleagues who've seen me launch my practice and have seen me have some success. And they're also interested in going the same route. And so they've come to me and I serve the same role to them that the other attorneys served to me when I launched my practice initially. I share, I share with them resources. I give them information about how to set up that practice. And I emphasize that, you know, it's important to lead on other attorneys as uh, you're going along in your journey. I'm gathering from your personality in our discussion that part of this ability to be outgoing, to be closely connected to your community in Brooklyn, to be networking, to be speaking on CLEs, this is critical to your ability to run a business, to get business, to to build a business book. Is that right? I mean, I'm seeing a, a parallelism between your ability to be giving back, but also raising your own business stakes. 100%. It is critical as a small law firm owner to get yourself out there. So like you're saying, it, as you're giving back, it's also helping you to get your name out there, right? So yeah. as I am doing CLEs or as I am mentoring uh, a colleague who's looking to start a practice, that's a form of marketing because that colleague may end up having a, a legal issue or one of their clients may have a legal issue that I could potentially assist them with. As I am doing CLEs, an attorney who, who attends my CLE could potentially reach out to me with uh, a legal matter for a client. So it it's, uh, serves a dual purpose uh, of both doing the right thing and helping people and being part of the community. And it also serves the purpose of marketing yourself and again, getting yourself out there. As a small offer money, you cannot uh, be somebody that is introverted and living in a shell. You have to be able to put yourself out there and to be active in the community so that you can get yourself out there and help both your community and your business at the same time. You mentioned prioritizing diversity within the firm that you're building. Are there diversity initiatives that you've seen succeed that you would recommend to other practitioners who want to prioritize diversity at their firms? A couple of years ago, I actually wrote an article about this, about how to increase diversity in the legal profession. I believe I wrote it for the New York City Bar Small Law Firm newsletter. It was a short article. And one of the things that I focused on was a program that two judges in New York County started where they required law firms who were arguing in front of them to bring along an associate a new associate to the argument and where appropriate to let them argue. So the judges were trying to force law firms to give new associates and sometimes diverse associates opportunities to be able to gain experience because that's one of the key barriers really to the legal profession being diverse. It's that barrier of experience. A lot of firms don't give a lot of opportunities for new associates to get, get experience. Oftentimes there are relegated to doing document review, to doing just basic work that's real, not really relevant to getting the experience that uh, they want to gain. And, and, and as a result, you see a lot of minority attorneys like myself starting their own practices to be able to gain that experience. I thought that uh, that initiative by the two judges in New York Supreme Court to require law firm owners, or partners rather, to have associates come and argue cases in front of them was something that uh, was a good idea. What would you tell someone who's considering going to law school but is unsure if they want to, and someone who's considering joining the Air Force but is unsure if they want to? I would tell them that make sure it's something that you want to do. Because ultimately, it has to be your decision. It can't be anybody else's. I know for me, when I was making a decision as an 18-year-old to join the Air Force, is something that I thought about uh, for quite a long time. I joined the Air Force in 2004, and that was during the Operation Iraqi Freedom. So the war was still going on. 
And I knew that it was important for me to serve, to give back to the country that had given so much to my family because I am an immigrant. I am a first generation immigrant from Haiti. I moved here when I was 12 years old. And, you know, I was quite young when 9 11 happened, and that impacted me very deeply. And so I wanted to serve and give back. And I also wanted to, you know, experience something different than just going straight to college. And so that was an important decision for me, and I made that decision. The same thing to, law, to go to law school. I made sure that this is something I wanted to do. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to be an attorney. I was attracted to the idea of being somebody that could be relied upon by the community, by the people around them to give them legal advice, someone that, that could be instrumental in making a difference in people's lives. And so that's why I joined. So my advice to anybody who looking to either go into the military or to law school is to make sure that it, it is something that you want to do because both uh, endeavors are not going to be easy. Uh, law school is not a it's not a, a cheap endeavor. It's just something certainly you have to pay for if you don't get a full ride. Uh, but there are lo loans that's involved, so it's a commitment. And the legal profession is changing. It's changing quite rapidly especially with the advent of AI and working from home. And it was the effects of the pandemic have changed the landscape of the legal profession. So you have to make sure that you are quite aware of what's happening and that you're prepared to take on that role. And also think about what kind of work you want to do when you get into the legal profession. What kind of life do you want to have? Do you want to go to a big law firm, which is per per perfectly fine? Uh, do you want to work? in the public sector and, and affect people's lives in that manner? Or do you want to be a business owner like myself and service your clients in a different way, in a way that's more conducive to your, you know, to your ideals and to what you're looking to accomplish? So think about that and, and then make your decision. I understand you have sought admission to the United States Supreme Court bar. Yes, it was an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. That opportunity came about through my law school to uh, the dean of my law school, Anthony Crowell, and a mentor of mine, uh, Judge Whiten. Uh, judge Mark Whiten happens to be a judge that I interned for uh, my first year of law school. Uh, he was a criminal court judge in New York County Supreme Court. I interned for him and judge developed a relationship with the clerk of the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, every year, in conjunction with New York Law School, uh, every couple of years, rather, he organizes uh, a trip for the alumni of New York Law School to go to, to, to the Supreme Court and to be admitted. And a couple of years ago, uh, I was lucky enough to be part of that contingent of folks who went up to the Supreme Court. And being admitted to the Supreme Court is quite important because it is the highest court in the land. It is the pinnacle of our profession. If you are an, a lawyer, you know, being an, admitted to the Supreme Court I don't think there could be any higher honor than that. Uh, and, and so it was something that I could not turn down. I had the privilege of being admitted the first day that the first black female Supreme Court justice was being sworn in. And so that was a tremendous honor to be there to see Judge Jackson being sworn in for the first time and to take in the enormity in the history of that moment. And so it was really an honor to be admitted to, to the Supreme Court. And I recommend it for any attorney who's interested in doing that to look into it. Very cool. Justice Jackson, incidentally, is the next guest on this lawyer's life. So stay tuned for that. Not really, but you know, we can always dream. <laughs> Would you say a little more about your relationship with Judge Whiten and how it affected your career? Yes, that relationship with Judge Whiten uh, played a key role in my professional growth, actually. Uh, Judge Whiten and I we went to the same law school. Uh, and he was quite involved with the New York Law School Black Student Association. And during my time at New York Law School, uh, I happened to be the president of that organization. And I also interned for Judge Whiten in my first year, after my first year. And I've maintained a relationship with Judge Whiten. Every year we go to his house, we have barbecue together. We see each other quite often. And Judge Whiten actually put me in connection with another judge, Judge Dakota Remzer, who is a judge in, in New York Supreme Court. And Judge Remzer actually introduced me to 
the judge that I ended up working for after law school, right? My mentor, my mentoring relationship with Judge Whiten led to the connection with Judge Ramser and led to me eventually working for a judge in Kings County Supreme Court. That, that relationship absolutely played a key role. Judge Whiten's father was actually a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh. And he is very involved in, in that organization. He served as the president of this Tuskegee Airmen for, I believe, like the East Coast Wing. And every year now, he organizes an event at New York Law School for the remaining Tuskegee Airmen. And we kind of bonded over that, over, over the military experiences both that I've had and that's involved in his family. And in addition to that, we were both committed to the law. We both committed to, you know, learning about the law. We were both committed to serving people. Judge Whiten, for a long time, worked as a, a DA in the Bronx and then eventually became a judge. And so that uh, sense of community service is something that we shared. Uh, we both family people. You know, but for that connection. And we also have the connection to New York Law School and to the Black Law Students Organization. Uh, we both go back and we, we talk to folks, we mentor folks. So the, that connection really uh, is something that stems from that. Can you think of any particular piece of advice that Judge Whiten gave you that really stuck with you or made a particular impact? Yes, absolutely. So Judge Whiten, the most important piece of advice that he gave to me was to make sure that I pay attention to details, that I'm very detail-oriented. And that's something I kind of carry over to from my military service, because in the military, you know, it's emphasized that you have to be detail-oriented. And the judge, really, when I would submit an opinion, a draft opinion to him, he would make sure that, that there were no typos involved and that I do my research thoroughly and that the case law that I cited were cases that were actually relevant. And so the judge, you know, his advice that I pay attention to detail and to make sure that I was doing good work has really fo followed me throughout my career. And now as an attorney and a business owner, that's something that I rely on tremendously because as I'm doing work with my client, I want to make sure that I'm producing good work and that I'm giving them best value. And if I don't, you know, pay attention to detail of their case, that could potentially end up in an unfavorable outcome for them. And so that is very important to me. Joanne Elise May, I want to thank you for your time and having this great conversation with us. Thank you for joining us on This Lawyer's Life. Gregor, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And yeah, take care. Thank you for listening to This Lawyer's Life. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the City Bar. Find more City Bar podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or Google or at our website, www.nycbar.org slash podcasts. And be sure to check out Building Belonging, a podcast that embraces authentic conversations about DEIB solutions by amplifying the most marginalized voices in the legal industry and exploring spaces others dare not. This podcast was produced and edited by Eli Cohen.